Yes, Mkwaya. Iris. And Iris. Now, can you show me the first which are there right now? All of them. One. It has a what? A light bar. You forgot about that, isn't it? Because you cannot have light without a what? A bulb. Without a source of light. Two. Projection lens. Three. Condensing lenses. Four. What? A screen. A screen. So those are the parts of the projector. We have talked of the reflector, which you can see. That is my pointer. So the reflector, which you can see, uh, which is concave in nature, and we have seen the purpose is to do reflect all the light from the powerful lamp back. Now remember, if you have a bulb that is giving out light, it tends to give out light in all the different directions. So to avoid all light that can be wasted, why we put a mirror behind is once the light comes from the source and it hits the mirror, then it is reflected back. As it is being reflected back, it goes straight away to the condenser. And this condenser consists of two lenses. Which lenses are plano convex lenses? You must have seen the plano convex lenses. If you get the entire convex lens and then you divide it into two parts, then one side will be straight, will be plain, then the other side will be curved. Okay? Something like this. One side will be then the other side will be like that. So if you arrange them, one facing the other side and then the other one facing the other side, then they form what we call a condenser. The condenser, you can see, it concentrates light rays on two watts. So the slide. This one is a slide. Now a slide acts as the object. Which object is to be thrown? On to the screen. All right, together. Now, like here, we use the slides. These ones are called slides, which we are throwing onto the screen for you to see. Are right, we together? So, we have the slides here, which we are showing you, which turn out to be the images you see. Then, the purpose of the projection lens is just to project the lens direct onto the screen. Very clear. So if they tell you to draw a well-labeled diagram of a projector. Our sister school, Deford Green. Can you give her a round of applause? Uh, she's also going to be part of the class and she wants to understand the chemistry that we are doing. Okay? We want to look at how we can determine the solubility of a salt. Okay? We are looking at how we can determine the solubility of a salt. And today we have a sample of the salt. Full solubility we want to determine. Okay? The salt is sodium chloride. So today we want to determine the solubility of sodium chloride practically. Okay, and of course the water we are, we are going to use to make the solution, we are going to get it from the tap. We are supposed to put 50 ml of water into our beaker and using our spatula, we are supposed to scoop a spatula end full of the salt at a time and allow it to dissolve. Okay? We will use the steering rod to help us dissolve the salt faster. Are we together? And we are going to continue adding the salt until no more salt dissolves. Okay? We are going to add the salt until no more salt dissolves. 
How do we call that solution when no more salt is able to dissolve? Yes, saturated solution. We call it a saturated solution. Okay? So we are going to dissolve the salt until we are able to uh, obtain a saturated solution. After we have obtained the saturated solution, we are going to filter it because there will be some salt which we do not want. Okay? Yes. So we will filter it off so that that salt remains and we will only have the filtrate. And after that, we are going to evaporate that solution to remove the water and remain with the salt that was able to dissolve in our water. Are we together? Yes. Yes. In our results, there is a table there where you're supposed to fill. Okay? Yes. yes. And the results that we need you to record, uh, as shown on your worksheet, is that we need to get the mass of our conical flask before we, do, we start the experiment. Then, afterwards, we need the mass plus the solution. That is before we evaporate the solution. Okay? Yes. And then afterwards, we need to get the mass of our, our dish, this conical flask, plus the dry salt. Are we together? Yes. And using the results that we would have obtained, we are supposed to determine the mass of the dry salt and then the mass of the water that would have been evaporated. Are we together? Yes. Yes. And with the results that we would have got, we know that solubility uh, is equal to the mass of the solute which saturates 100 grams of water. So from what you would have got from your experiment, uh, you will be uh, required to determine the solubility of the salt. Because from your results, you would have got the mass of the water that was able to dissolve your salt and you know the mass of the dry salt that was able to dissolve in the water. Is that clear? Yes. Any questions before we can uh, proceed? Any can we proceed? Yes. Okay. You all have the worksheets? <laughs> helps greatly in uh, facilitating erosion in a given area. Now, in the next, in the next slide, we're going to see the different pictures that show us the different types of erosion, and then we shall mention the types of erosion for each picture. So, be, be alert, take note of the diagram. Under erosion, you must have looked at the different types. Maybe the primary and the primary. What are some of the types of erosion? Erosion of the 
sheet erosion. And then finally, what is left out? Those are the identified splash, rail, sheet erosion. What is remaining? What is remaining? Gali. So those are the major types of erosion. Whereby rain drop erosion that's talked about. Process number three is representing an area where the grass or the land has been protected by cover crops or grass. Okay? Okay. So we are going to look at how each of these places can be affected by uh, soil erosion. Okay? Especially in uh, having an agent like running water. Is that okay? Yeah. So I'm going to have two people. Come and hold the... Now you can see? So you are holding this one so that water can spill down. Make sure the water doesn't fall down, okay? So we are looking at what happens. This is rainfall. That is rainfall. And we are going to see <laughs> what if it doesn't work? We are going to see the ability of. We are only looking at the ability of soil which is not protected. How you can set that set it aside on the other side, but we need the glass here. This one can keep it on the other side. Chinese. But you are timid. Watch what happens. I think. <laughs> and put it on the other side. <laughs> Sandra, Sandra, I see. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> not smiling. That is rainfall. And now, do we see? Area. Why is this water very dusty? Because it contains a lot of soil particles. Now it shows that areas that don't have cover crops, areas that don't have forests, is it? So yeah, that shows high level of soil erosion. And in our experiment number two, where we had mulching, you can see there are some small soil particles, okay? Few of them. And that's why our water is a bit clear. It means that the dry materials are able to trap the water. It reduces the speed and it holds even the soil particles together so that it does not get transported by what? By the running water. Is that okay? Yeah. And even wind cannot transport the soil that is covered by dry materials. And here is the magic. Vegetation cover. You see the water? Yes. Very clear. Why? Because the vegetation, the roots of the plants have what we call uh, the ability to keep the soil particles firm. Okay? That is what the vegetation cover tries to speed uh, to reduce the speed of running a water and therefore the soil is very firmly protected. That's why we have very clear water. Is that okay? Yes. So which of the methods do you think is good? Uh-huh. Having a, the land protected by either the cover crops, okay? Or afforestation. I'm going to give you an example. 